Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Mickey and I'm a fully conceited alcoholic. And uh, it says in this little thing, it says, Hi, Mickey, we love you, Mickey. Lots and lots and lots, whole bunches. <laughs> All right, so, well, I'm, I'm really glad to be here, and I thank the committee for allowing me to come here and share and uh, be a small part of this great whole. I love being a participating uh Member uh, and and to uh, support Wacky Par and uh, all the Par Par Pars. I actually started um, young people's conventions and meetings in Australia back in '94. I was just telling Angie, my friend Angie P, visiting from Cincinnati. She uh, in uh, they had no young people's meetings and conventions in Australia. So back in '94, I went down there and started Vicky Par. In the, in the territory of Victoria, and um, we had a wonderful co- uh, convention there, Vicky Park, and now all seven territories of Australia have thriving young people's conventions. So from little acorns, great big oak trees grow, you know. So um, this is just another small part of that great whole wacky part. I always think that it really means wild and crazy young people of AA. You know, that's what it seems to be. Anyway, I'm going to hit the first three steps here, uh, certainly a version that uh, may be familiar or, or unfamiliar with you, um, uh, the way I take my troops through the first three steps and uh, what I teach them. And before I do the first three steps, I do what I call the step before the steps. And why I do that is because there's a tremendous um, variable on what people believe the first step to be. I was at the meeting last night and the speaker in a whole room full of people stood at the podium and said that she did, uh, it was easy for her to do the first step. She knew she was an alcoholic a long, long time before she even got to AA. So when she got to Alcoholics Anonymous, it was no good, no big deal for her to admit that she was an alcoholic. Well, of course, there's no mention of admitting we're alcoholic in the first of the 12 steps. See, people confuse it with the first step in recovery. See, the first step, what I call the step before the steps, is learning to fully concede to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. It's in the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Anybody read this book, by the way? Who reads the book? Yeah, good, 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 good. In the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous, it says... We learned we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery, but it's not the first of the 12 steps. That is a totally different step, though often confused. I I see guys being told that they've done the first of the 12 steps. As soon as they walk through the door, raise their hand as an alcoholic, they're, they're ready for step two. It's not true. And it causes a great deal of uh, discontent and and eventually a great deal of relapse. And and that's what I want to prevent. We've got to come from the space of being an alcoholic to then, who wants to get over it, to ask, what do I have to do? And that's on page 20 of the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous, that we all read, don't we? Yes, yeah, good. It says on page 20, If you are an alcoholic who wants to get over it, what do I want to get over? Have I ever checked what do I want to get over? What is it that I want to get over? It's a question. If you are an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? So I've got to come from the space of being an alcoholic who wants to get over it to then ask, what do I have to do? Presumably, if you ask somebody like me or somebody that had gone before us and left footprints for us to follow, 
Um, they would tell you if you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, we have a program, a spiritual program, 12-step spiritual program, starting with step one. So I've got to come from the space of being an alcoholic to then become capable of doing the first of the 12 steps, which is step one. See, totally different step to admitting we're alcoholic. They're often confused. I'm sure well-meaning people, at least I hope they're well-meaning, uh, say these things. But it's not true, and, it's, uh, and it causes a great deal of uh, difficulty down the road of peace when the, th when the message is not being carried correctly. I call it lip-flapping party line bullshit that you hear in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous that have nothing to do with nothing but gets bantered around as if it's the deal. For example, we hear a lot of uh, admittance, acceptance and surrender not even mentioned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, folks. Admittance, acceptance and surrender ain't even mentioned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, but it gets bantered around as if it's the deal. Got to surrender, got to accept. You know, admitted in the first of the 12 steps is the closest we come to admittance. Otherwise, it's not even mentioned. And because folks are, are talking about admittance, acceptance and surrender, which ain't in the program, they're not talking about what is in the program, and that's we learned we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. Not the ego being smashed. There's no mention of the ego being smashed. That's what everybody wants to quote, but it doesn't say that. It says the delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. See? And of course, that is the great, uh, you know, ism of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I sabotage myself. Oh, incredibly short memory. We have this incredibly short memory where this disease is concerned. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll remember the two dollars some dick owes us from 20 years ago, <laughs> you know, but we'll forget what we got to do and what happens to us if we don't do it, you know, and that's what happens. ISM, incredibly short memory, or I sponsor me, or I sabotage myself, etc., 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 ism. Incredibly short memory is, uh, is what I tend to lean towards. But we've got to get it. Now, we've got to learn. It says, we learn we had to. So we had to do it, and it has to be done. There's nothing suggestive there, my friends. All this suggested only crap, you know. It, there's nothing suggested there. We had to do it, and it has to be done. You see? I liken that to what the judge said to me many, many times. Yes, Mr. Bush, you can have bail provided you pay your fine. It was conditional, and that's what this program is, very conditional, provided that we had to do it and it had to be done. You know? So, what is it that I have to do and what is it, how, how do I do it? We learned we had to fully concede. What, do I know what fully concede is? Do I even know what it is about me that makes me alcoholic? We, we haven't got sufficient time here. I usually do these uh, little workshops in, in a, a minimum of two hours. But we've just got about 50 minutes to cover some ground, so I, I can't banter with you back and forth with questions. But, you know, one of the things that most people don't understand is what it is about them that makes them alcoholic. They think they do know. They believe they know and they say they know, but they actually don't. What it is about me that makes me alcoholic isn't what I do because I'm alcoholic. What makes me alcoholic isn't the consequences and the results of being an alcoholic. What makes me alcoholic isn't, you know, all the stuff that you hear uh, about alcoholics. One's too many, a thousand ain't enough. Once I start, I can't stop. I can't stop from starting. I can't control and enjoy my drinking. I've got a twofold disease, obsessing of the mind, allergy of the body, etc., etc., etc. All that's true if you're alcoholic, but it's not what makes me alcoholic. There's something very specific about me that makes me alcoholic. There's something different about me being alcoholic than my three sisters and brother. I got three sisters and a brother, and they're not alcoholic. 
They have all the reasons to be an alcoholic. Same blood, same family, same environment, same everything, same pain, same, you know, hang-ups that alcoholics have, but they're not alcoholic. They're not alcoholic because they don't have what I have. What I have is an abnormal reaction to alcohol. They don't have that abnormal reaction to alcohol. They don't even like drinking. They don't drink very often. In fact, I don't know why. I ask them, why don't you drink? They say, I don't like it. They say, what don't you like about it? They say, well, you know, if I've won too many, I feel sick. I say, sick? You've got to drink past that. <laughs> you know? Who stops at sick? I don't stop at sick. I pimp, but I don't stop drinking. You know, they don't laugh. They think I'm weird. Any other weirdos here? Yeah. And the rest of you lying mothers. I know weirdos when I see them, you know. All my life people said, what is wrong with you? What the hell is wrong with you? For Christ's sake, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and they would ask me what's wrong with me as if I knew. What is wrong with you? Oh, actually, I've got a twofold disease. It's an obsession of the mind, allergy of the body. I can't control my drinking. I don't know what's wrong with me. What's wrong with you? Why do you drink like you do? Why don't you drink like I do? See, because I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with me when I get here. My three sisters and brother, not alcoholic. I'm alcoholic. I'm alcoholic. My three sisters and brother ain't alcoholic. They got a couple of kids apiece. My, two, my three sisters and brother got uh, a couple of kids apiece. Well, I got a couple of kids. I ain't never been married, never had a wife, you know, of my own. But I got a couple of kids and... Uh, you know, I'm alcoholic, my kids ain't. My three sisters and brother ain't alcoholic, their kids are. And I'm here to help those. See, what it is about me that makes me alcoholic isn't what I do because I'm alcoholic. What makes me alcoholic is in my abnormal reaction to alcohol. The doctor's opinion says men and women drink primarily because they like the effect produced by alcohol. What is that effect produced by alcohol? What is the effect that the doctor's talking about men and women like? Alcohol is a mind-altering substance. Alcohol is a drug. D-R-U-G-S. Devil's revenge upon God's subjects. Drugs. See? Anybody here do a few drugs? Anybody do a lot? Yeah, no shit. You see? I'm not... I, I, this is Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, we're talking about alcohol. But, uh, you know, if you didn't do drugs, if you just and only drank alcohol... You know, if you're a specialist, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you're here, but I ain't no specialist. I'm a chemical gourmet, me. You know? I was a social drug user. Any social drug users here, though? A couple of al perhaps. Yeah. I knew I was a social user because every time anybody said, I'm going to get loaded, I said, social eye, social eye. <laughs> Any social users here now? Oh, yeah, yeah. See, look. What makes me alcoholic is that I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol. And what that abnormal reaction to alcohol is, is that it changes my perception of reality. Now, every one of you knew that, unless I'd asked you. If I'd asked you, you wouldn't have been able to give it to me, mostly, but because I've just said it, and you all zone in on it now. But you won't remember that at 2 o'clock in the morning if you haven't had it burnt into your consciousness. Alcohol changes my perception of reality. That's what alcohol does for the alcoholic that it doesn't do for the normal person. We think it does, but it doesn't. Alcohol doesn't do that for my three sisters and brother. They don't even like the effect produced by alcohol. They sometimes get drunk, they sometimes go on a bender. But come Monday morning, they take their kids to school, they pay their bills, and they take care of their responsibilities. They don't come to Tijuana with me. You know, see, alcohol changes my perception of reality. Why do I want to change in perception of reality? Because I can't stand reality. That's why I hate reality. I don't want nothing to do with reality. I can't stand reality. Screw reality. I hate you and I hate this rotten world and this rotten shit that we have to do in it. You know, I don't know what you brought to recovery, but what I brought was a lot of hurt and hate. Hurt and hate. I hurt and I hate everything. 
and alcohol had stopped doing its job. Alcohol had stopped changing my perception of the reality. I was addicted to doing it. I had a drunk body and a sober mind. I couldn't stop doing it, and once I was doing it, I couldn't stop from doing it, but it wasn't changing my perception of reality. It wasn't making it okay for me to be in here in this rotten world with you rotten people doing rotten shit, and I hurt and I hate. Hate women, can't stand women. I hate homos and queers and anybody different. I hate black people, I'm totally racist and prejudiced. I'm from London, England, living in Los Angeles, and I hate foreigners. You know, I can't stand me. I hate you and get away from me and don't come near me. And with all that torment and turmoil going on inside that alcohol used to fix for me, now isn't being fixed. And with all that torment and turmoil going on inside, I still have to try and present to you a picture of somebody you will like. Because when your higher power is what people think of you, if you don't like me, I'm screwed. And I don't know what's wrong with me. I have no idea. Of course I do today. My name's Mickey Bush. I'm an alcoholic. I'm in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I know what's wrong with me and I know what to do about it. That's a lot of shit right there. And I never brought that in here with me on January the 15th, 1983. Didn't know nothing about nothing, thinking I knew everything about everything. I was so sick, I didn't even know I was sick. And that's really sick. Do you know how sick that is? Do you know how sick it is to be so sick that you don't know you're sick? That's really sick. And if you're as sick as I was when I got here, so sick that you scan a room like this and you think, well, I ain't as sick as him. Do you know how sick that is? Do you know how sick it is to be in a meeting full of alkies thinking you ain't as sick as the next guy? That's really sick. So if you're in here today wondering whether you is or whether you isn't a real alcoholic or not, I want you to know that I can relate to being as sick as you don't think you are. Really sick. And I didn't know. I didn't know. I had no idea. I never came here with the only requirement for membership. I never knew what was wrong with me. I never knew what to do about it. I don't know why I do what I do. Why do I do what I do? I don't know why I do what I do. I just do it. Always have done it. You know, I drink. I don't... You guys all know why you did it. I don't know why I did it. I come in here and you guys are talking about you drank because you couldn't stand the pain and you were hiding behind who you was and you were had all these issues. Like past the tissues, I got issues. You know, I think, at what stage of the game do you discover that? I can't imagine that, me. I cannot imagine going in any pub I ever drank and saying to the bartender, oh, bartender, hit me with a triple shot of your best booze, because I can't stand who I am and I want to cover up the pain tonight. Never happened, folks. Never happened. Oh, Mr. Dealer Man, give me an extra rock of crack cocaine, because uh, I really feel inadequate. <laughs> Never happened. Never happened. Never happened. I have no idea why I do what I do. I don't know I'm alcoholic. I don't know nothing about nothing. But you guys did, and I came here and I stuck with you. And I've been coming back ever since. Even after 29 years, I could not, I could not tell you the last two days in a row that I didn't go to a meeting. I go to lots and lots of meetings. So, we learned we had to fully concede to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. I'm beginning to get an idea of what it is about me that makes me alcoholic. Alcohol changes my perception of reality. It changes me from a duck to an eagle. I go out drinking as a delicate little duck, have a few stiff ones and turn into an eagle and go swooping around looking for prey. And it's not P-R-A-Y either. <laughs> Alcohol changes me from a duck to an eagle. And I like that. I like the effect produced by alcohol. I can't stand like the natch. I don't like being on the natch. That's why I wrote the word sober. S-O-B-E-R. Son of a bitch. Everything's real. You know? When I am induced by something, it's real and I hate real. The doctor says men and women drink primarily because they like the effect produced by alcohol. That effect produced by alcohol is that it changes my perception of reality. He goes on to say that unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, not ease and comfort, the sense of ease and comfort from taking a, a couple of drinks, drinks they see other people taking with impunity, they are restless, irritable and discontent. I know all about RID. R-I-D, restless, irritable and discontent. Anybody here know about RID? Yeah, no shit. <laughs> yeah. See, so... 
you know, I'm beginning to get an idea. Now I've got to fully concede. What's the difference between admittance, acceptance, and surrender and fully concede? Well, it's fairly obvious. In the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, on page one of the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous, it's Bill's story, he talks about war fever ran high in the New England town of which us new young officers from from Pittsburgh were assigned. I fancied myself a leader who had not had 22 and a veteran of foreign wars. He's talking about the World War I in Europe when the Yanks came over there to Europe, kicked the Kaiser's ass and saved our bacon. Kaiser Wilhelm was rampaging through the world, going to take over the world, did a very silly thing. He upset you bad boys from the US of A, and you bad boys from the US of A came over there and kicked his ass. That German army were defeated. They admitted that defeat. They accepted that defeat, and they surrendered. Listen to what I just said. You guys came over and kicked the ass of that German army, and that German army were defeated. They admitted that defeat. They accepted that defeat, and they surrendered. Well, guess what? I was born in the Second World War, 1943. Hitler, little ship pot Hitler, was rampaging through Europe, going to take over the world. He was going to put a thousand years of Third Reich, Holocaust and everything else. Did a very silly thing. Hitler upset you bad boys from the US of A, and you bad boys from the US of A came over there to Europe and kicked his ass and saved our bacon again. We're very glad you did that. We thank you very much. <laughs> wasn't the first time you did that you did that in 1914-18 when Bill Wilson came over kicked the Kaiser's ass that, that German army were defeated they admitted that defeat they accepted that defeat and they surrendered but did they fully concede did they fully concede no, no they came back and did it again beginning to sound familiar folks in 1943, they came back again. A little ship pots here and says, let's storm into Poland and Czechoslovakia. And nobody said, no, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Those bad boys from the US of A have come over and kick our ass like they did in the, don't do that. They said, no, what do you do? This time it'll be different. <laughs> Sounding familiar? Yeah. And, they, and of course you had to come and do it fully concede to my innermost self when I fully concede as opposed to admittance, acceptance and surrender because I can admit something today and deny it tomorrow I can accept it today and refute it tomorrow I can surrender to it today and give me an Uzi and a box of ammo and come and get some of this big boy no but when I fully concede it's a done deal when I fully concede to my innermost self fully concede to my innermost self. Most people have no idea what their innermost self is. They talk about their mind. My disease lays in my mind and what I do with my mind is think, so there's a good chance my thinking is going to be diseased. My mouth, my truth. I speak with a forked tongue. I can't afford that. I speak with a forked tongue. I'll take an advantage any chance I get. My heart. Oh, the longest journey from your head to your heart, from your heart to your head. <laughs> My heart's been broken many times and will be again. It ain't no good in there. But in my gut level honesty, the core of my being, where I can fully concede to where there's just me and the old man upstairs, Gus, G-U-S, guy upstairs, that's why I call my old man upstairs, where I can be perfectly, completely truthful, rigorously, no looking good, no argument, no debate, no discussion, no can we make a deal, it's a done deal. And when I fully concede to my innermost self, two things change. One of them is that I ain't relying on memory, incredibly short memory. I hear a lot of folks say, I'm never going to drink again, I, I remember what happened last time. Well, guess what? If you're relying on memory and it changes, what do you think is going to happen to a guy like me? I'm never going to drink again. I, 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 I remember what happened last time, and and and, uh, and I know, I know what happened. Well, if you're relying on knowledge and it changes, and if you're relying on memory and it fades, you're screwed. When we fully concede to our innermost self, we ain't got to rely on two things: memory and knowledge. It's a done deal to the to my innermost self, to my gut level honesty. I know what's wrong with me, and those voices can't get through to me. Anybody relate to the voices that talk to you? Who relates to the voices that talk to you? Yeah, you know the voices I'm talking about. 
Them voices that just said what voices? Them voices. <laughs> you know them voices? Drive you bloody crazy, them voices. Drive you crazy. Talk to you, don't they? They tell you shit. You're useless. You are, you're a useless turd. You're like a turd on a wedding cake. Useless. <laughs> Your girlfriend's cheating on you. Your best friend's getting some. <laughs> you're going to get fired today. You're useless, you are. You're going to get fired today. Drive you crazy. You've got to drink to get rid of the voices driving you crazy. Change your perception of reality. When I fully concede, it's a done deal. How many times do you hear people that they, they go along, as the disease gets worse, they do less. In my house, a guy with 90 days came in, he was fully determined, going to meetings, reading the book. 90 days later, the disease is fatal and progressive. 90 days later, the disease is 90 days worse. He wants to do less. It's the only disease, I think, that does that. As the disease gets worse, we want to do less. That's insane. You know, if you had a, a, a you know, a, a boo-boo or something on your leg or you got an infected leg or you, your mum was putting a poultice on it or something, as it got worse, she wouldn't put less poultice on it, would she? But we do. As our disease gets worse, we do less. I see folks with 20 and 30 years go into a meeting perhaps once a year to take a cake or something. Want what they got, they're like withered up old prunes. Wrinkly and like sad. Don't want nothing they got. Yeah. That's why we come to Alcoholics Anonymous, to keep supple and to keep, you know, motivated, to keep doing and to keep abreast of this fatal progressive disease. My disease is 28 years worse, not better. People think we get better here. We don't. We get worse. The disease gets worse. But what counteracts the progression of the disease is the progression of our recovery, if it stays right alongside it. And a lot don't. That's why there's a total difference between sober and sobriety. People talk about sobriety. We give 30-day chips or 30 days of sobriety. No, at best it may be 30 days sober. Ain't got no sobriety. I see people are walking around here in Alcoholics Anonymous been sober a long time. Ain't got no sobriety. I know that from a personal experience. Every time I was released from a joint, no matter what kind of a joint it was, whether it was an insane asylum for the criminally insane, whether it was a maximum security, a minimum security, whether it was a jitter joint, whatever kind of joint it was, I was as physically sober as I stand before you right now. I've been physically sober many, many times in my life. Never had any sobriety. I know the difference between sober and sobriety. Sobriety, S-O-B-R-I-E-T-Y. Staying off booze, recovery is everything to you. That's what sobriety is. Sober is son of a bitch. Everything's real. Totally different. Anyway, moving along. I wanted to make that step before the steps. I've got to come from a space of being an alcoholic who wants to get over it. What, have I done the work to discover what it is about me and what it is about alcoholism that I'm suffering from? Better do that work, folks. I want to get over it and I'm going to ask, ASK, ask Saving Kit for help, H-E-L-P, His Ever Loving Presence. I'm going to ask for help. And that brings me to a point of something that else that's not in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. People think it is, but it's not. It gives me a chuckle when they try and read into the program stuff that isn't there, but they want to believe is there. Do you know what isn't mentioned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous? Hitting bottom. Hitting bottom's not mentioned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. People think it is because of stuff like pitiful and incomprehensibly demoralized. That's paid, P-A-I-D. But that's not what hitting bottom's all about. Hitting, being in a state of pitiful and incomprehensibly demoralization may, may allow you to become capable of hitting bottom, but in and of itself it's not the bottom. People think, believe and say it is, but it's not. Hitting bottom is a totally different thing. And we say in our meetings, Things like everybody's bottom's different. Better not be different. There's no unity in being different. But we say shit like that in meetings. Hitting bottom is the same for all of us not different, if we understand what it actually is. But most people don't. They think they do. Hitting bottom. H-I-T-B-O-T-T-O-M. Hurting inside, totally burnt out, turned to our master. When you ask most people about hitting bottom, 
What do they do? They tell you the consequences and the results of their untreated alcoholism. You ask them if you hit bottom, they say, yeah. You say, tell me about it. They tell you about detox. They tell you about being locked away and clean. They tell you about losing everything. They've lost the family, the kids, everything gone. That's not what hitting bottom is. People think it is, but it's not. That's the outside circumstances and conditions of our life at the tail end of our drinking. Not hitting bottom. People think it is. People are amazing, what they say. I just asked a couple recently about hitting bottom. Nice couple. I'm very fond of them, as a matter of fact. And uh, they love being in clean and sober, and um, they work hard. I said, you know, it's absolutely essential that we hit bottom first. Because although Bill never wrote anything about it in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, he had more revealed to him as it's promised more would be revealed to us. Bill in the 12 and 12, which I asked for but haven't got up here right now, I'd like to read it to you so that you just don't have to believe me, but I can point to it in the book, in the literature. He says, why all this insistence that every alcoholic must hit bottom first? Anybody know this? Anybody familiar with this in the first step of the 12 and 12? Is that a yes? Yes. 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 Why all this insistence that every alcoholic must hit bottom first? If you think about that, that's some ballsy shit to say to a bunch of drunks, isn't it? Drunks who don't like authoritative figures and being told what to do. Hit bottom on this, Father Mucker. <laughs> you know. But it was so important that he insisted that every alcoholic must hit bottom first. That's how important. Why? because it's the process that brings us back to the power we've abandoned to ask for help. And I didn't even know that I had abandoned the power. I didn't know that I was in the grips of a fatal progressive disease that is so powerful it had me by the short ones and just sucked me in and was so powerful that long before I got here, years before the onset of untreated alcoholism, the disease had gotten me to abandon God and spirituality so that along the path of life, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly, the disease became all powerful in my life, dictating and dominating everything I say, do, think and feel and in and of myself I am helpless, hopeless and powerless to resist its demands and have to do what it wants me to do which is drink. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The disease was the power in my life, the negative power, because it had gotten me to abandon the positive power God, Jesus, Buddha, Allah, Muhammad, or any other noun you want to use. Whatever works for you is okay by us. Nobody gives a shit. And here in bottom is the act of turning back to the power to ask for help, usually in desperation. We call it the gift of desperation, G-O-D, the gift of desperation. I asked folks about hitting bottom. I asked my friend, my couple. I said to the little chickadee, I said, have you hit bottom, love? She, she said, oh yeah, Mick, I've hit bottom. I said, I'm curious, tell me about it. Oh, she said, it's easy. She said, I was feet to the curb, hustling the Broadway, prostituting myself so that I could earn a dollar so I could get loaded. I said, that wasn't your bottom, love. She said, well, I think it was. I said, I don't give a shit what you think. I asked her, dude, I said, have you hit bottom, pal? He said, yes. I said, I'm curious. Tell me about it. He said, Mick, it was easy. I was locked up in a penitentiary, married to Bubba. I said, that wasn't your bottom. He said, it felt like it was. <laughs> Bad minds. They got bad minds. See, hitting bottom is the same for all of us, not different. Yours was the same as mine, ours was the same as theirs, theirs was the same as ours. In the beautiful book it says, alcoholics of our kind. I know in our meetings we say things like everybody's bottom's different. Better not be different. No unity in being different. Don't know what hitting bottom's all about. I didn't. But I sought. I sought the answers. I, I latched on to the people that had gone before me. I wanted to know these important things. Hitting bottom. What was hitting bottom? Many, many times I'd been desperate enough to cry out for help. But it's no good me crying out for help and asking God for his strength, inspiration, direction and then doing what I want to do. That's no good. 
But here in bottom isn't about the outside circumstances and conditions of my life. We think it is, but it's not. And there's a danger in believing that. See, believing that the outside circumstances and conditions of my life is the bottom is very dangerous because as those outside circumstances and conditions get better and improve, we falsely believe that we've gotten better and improve and drink again. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Is that a yes? I sponsor a guy, he's a celebrity, you all know him by name. He said, Mick, I don't understand. I said, I know you don't. He said, I don't understand. What's all this unmanageability? What do you mean unmanageable? My life's unmanageable. I, I, I had nine people on a management team to manage my affairs. I said, I know you do. He said, well, what's unmanageable? I said, well, ain't it strange that you can't get out of bed in the morning? Ain't it strange that you're on three or four different meds? Ain't it strange that you're crying in your cornflakes? Ain't it strange that your old lady hates your guts? Ain't it strange that your kids can't wait to leave home? Ain't it strange that you pick your puppy up and it pisses in your lap? Don't sound very manageable to me. Well, I, I didn't think it meant that. I said, no, I know, don't think. Rely on your looks. <laughs> See, people have weird concepts. See, hitting bottom is that state where in God, we call it gift of desperation. G happens to spell God, G-O-D. On January the 15th, 1983, without knowing what was happening, without knowing who I was talking to, without knowing what I was saying, and without knowing what the consequences of what I was saying was going to be. In desperation and despair, I can remember very clearly, it's crystal clear to me, I can remember going, help me, please help me, what's wrong with me, what am I going to do? And asked for help from outside of myself. And guess what? Though this disease had gotten me to abandon him, he hadn't abandoned me. And when I turned back to him and asked for help in, guess, in desperation, he seemed to be looking over my shoulder and he seemed to say, Mick, you silly bastard, I've been waiting for you to ask. Now get yourself out of that 12-step fellowship. Sent me to you. Here was the power he provided for an alky like me to not have to drink today. Here was a power greater than myself that I could absolutely depend upon. And in the beautiful book it says, with this attitude you cannot fail. We know what you are thinking, we know how you feel. Here was a guarantee. Here was a 12-step spiritual fellowship. This power that's in this room right here, right now, so powerful that it can dispel the, the obsession to drink. We call it divine providence. Most people don't know what divine providence is, but I don't want to let this opportunity go because my troops that are here today, they do know. You ask them what divine providence means, they'll tell you. But I ask all the time, what is divine providence? You know what I get told mostly? Number one answer, family feud. An act of God. No, not an act of God. Divine providence. It's the only thing that can dispel the obsession to, for destructive drinking that has warped my mind, as the book says. We have warped our minds. It's such an obsession for destructive drinking that only an act of providence can remove it from us. First step in the 12 and 12. First paragraph. Starts off by saying, who cares to admit complete defeat? Practically no one, of course. And because practically no one, of course, cares to, practically no one, of course, does, so there's practically no one, of course, who has, so there's practically no one, of course, to ask, how the hell do I? But if you go up and ask one of these troops that ain't, ain't done the work, yeah. how the hell do I? They ain't going to say, no good asking me, pal, I'm in the practically no one, of course, department. <laughs> They're going to say, Keep coming back, think, 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 don't drink no matter what, work the steps, go to meet, and jerk your chain. You know, this disease is going to kill more alcoholics than Alcoholics Anonymous is going to save. But we have a, a duty to perform and to carry this message, not those messages. There's no S on the end of path. Rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. 
There's no S on the end of path. Those who do not recover are those who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. <laughs> I mean men and women. A little slip of the tongue there. Yeah. <laughs> there are those two. There are those two. Those two there. Look, those two. You see them? Those two there. Yeah. Anyway, a bit of fun. You know, I, uh, I, I didn't know what hitting bottom was. But it's the act of turning back to the power and asking for help. And that's the same for all of us, not different. There's no difference in that. There's no, you know, different for everybody. And, and those outside circumstances may be different for everybody, but they're not what at the bottom is. They sometimes enable us to become capable of fitting bottom. So here I am here. Me plus you is a power greater than me. You plus us is a power greater than you. Together we can do what I couldn't do alone. I couldn't stay sober, you couldn't stay sober, but together we could stay sober. In the first of the 12 steps, in the very first step, has anybody ever noticed how it kind of contradicts itself? You know, it says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous, in the beautiful book, we of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then the very first step says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Well, guess what? We've never done that. We've never admitted that we were powerless. Why? Because we ain't powerless. We ain't powerless. We have never admitted that we were. Ever since Bill met Bob, we have never been powerless. People go, oh, well, it don't mean that. It means me. Whatever happened to just read the black parts? <laughs> just read the black parts. It says, we admitted we were powerless. But people like to put an interpretation out. When I was a me, I was powerless. When I was a me, I was helpless, hopeless, and powerless. But you guys said, let go, turn it over. So where, if you take me and flip it over, what does it become? We. we. When I was a me, I was helpless, hopeless, and powerless. Turned it over and became a we. Here, I have a 12-step spiritual fellowship. You guys introduced me to a big book, B-I-G-B-O-O-K, -O -O Believing in God Beats Our Old Knowledge. In the beautiful book was a program, P-R-O-G-R-A-M, People Relying on God Relaying a Message. Message, M-E-S-S-A-G-E, -S -S -E, Me Step, Sponsoring God Every Day, Sponsor, S-P-O-N-S-O-R, Sober Person, Offering Newcomers Suggestions on Recovery. How? Through the steps, S-T-E-P-S, -E Solution to Every Problem, Sober. Through the gift of God, G-I-F-T, God is forever there. Where do you get it from the gifts? God is for, God is forever there. Get it from the steps. Well, what do I get from the steps? Get recovery. Get to be sober. Sober? What's sober? S-O-B-E-R. Well, why do I want to be sober? Because if you want to quit drinking and don't replace it with the steps, you go crazy. You go nuts. N-U-T-S. Not using the steps. <laughs> now, everybody followed that, right? <laughs> yeah. I got so much bloody power as long as I'm staying here being a small part of this great hole, I don't know what to do with it for Christ's sake. <laughs> Become here, I said to my sponsor, what should I do with all this power I got over alcohol? He said, give it away, he said, give it away, go down there to Wacky Park, give it to them. Don't worry, they won't want it. <laughs> See, look, powerless. What did powerless mean? I ask people all the time, what does powerless mean? Powerless is not what happens to me because I'm powerless. Powerless is the absence of power. In the beautiful book it says there's one who has all power, that one is God, may you find him now. Well, if i got to find him, it means I ain't got him. And if he's the source and he's the power over everything and I'm powerless, it means I'm godless. In the first step, powerless over alcohol means godless over alcohol. Not once too many, a thousand, eight and a half, once I start, I can't stop, I can't control my drinking, I have no power, once I put a bottle drinking my body of any kind. No, all that's all that's true if you're alcoholic, but it's not what powerless is. Powerless is the absence of power. It's not too difficult, is it? <laughs> I, 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 I had this discussion with Father Martin before he passed. I love Father Martin and my Father Martin. Anybody who knows Father Martin and chalk talk and stuff? It's really great. I spent the night with Father Martin just before he passed, and we talked of this and many things. And I laid out this thing that I got about powerlessness 
not being what happens to me, but being the absence of power. Call it God if you like. He came forward in his chair and he went, that's exactly right. 82 years old, a genius. A couple of weeks later, I went to listen to him talk. He stole my line. <laughs> he said, he went to God and he said, God, what you have all of, I have none of. Can I have some, please? Power to not have to drink today. Here it is, right here, right now. Powerless over alcohol. The unmanageability is the thinking side of the twofold disease. Obsession of the mind, allergy of the body. Powerless over alcohol is the physical side. Unmanageability is the thinking side. I can't sit down at a desk and manage my affairs and get my bills paid and do the laundry and get the car out of the shop and take care of my childcare. I, I used to be able to do all that in a, in a breeze. Now I'm a day late and a dollar short. Just don't seem to be able to cope. Don't seem to be able to manage. I just want to be able to manage, but don't seem to be able to anymore. I used to be able to, and now, and now I'm just destitute, and I'm hurting. The unmanageable, the thinking side of the two fouls of disease. The powerlessness is the absence of power. I don't know why we call, well, I don't know why we walk around here claiming we're powerless. We got so much bloody power over our goals, as long as we stay together, being a small part of this great whole. In the third step, made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood God. Understood is a past tense word. It's a past tense word because the understanding comes from one and two. And I knew better have an understanding that makes sense to you. In the beautiful book it says he can choose any concept of God he likes provided it makes sense to him. Page 93. Provided it makes sense to him. Condition. I ask my troops, give it to me. Give me the sense it makes to you. Oh, I don't know what you mean. What do you want from me? What do I want from you? Don't, don't sound like you've got nothing. Don't, you don't even know how to explain the concept of God that you've got. You ain't got to understand God. You've just got to have an understanding of something that's a power greater than yourself. And if you're like me, an atheist and an agnostic, and the God shit nearly run me out of here, well-meaning people, at least I hope they're well-meaning, said, let go and let God. I said, what? They said, turn it over to God. I said, what? said, pray to God. I said, screw you. If I, pr <laughs> if I pray to him, he'll know where I am. <laughs> you know, I've been ducking God for years. Why would I pray to something that was going to strike me blind for playing with the old ding -ling, for Christ's sake? <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> oh, you did that shit too, huh? <laughs> yeah. These are trifocals. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I did it anyway. When I found out how good it felt, I thought, well, I'll risk one eye. <laughs> you know, I won't pray to no god of my understanding, for Christ's sake. That punishing, threatening, God, get screwed out, and I was bolting out of it. And some Native American brothers said, Mick. Come, come, come chit chat to us. We got a way of putting things about the great spirit that might be more appealing for you. And they broadened that whole horizon for me. I never came in here with any spirituality, uh, and you guys, it, you know, I came in here broke, busted, disgusted, and not to be trusted. Today I'm a very wealthy man financially and materially, but my greatest asset is that loving God you taught me about. I would no sooner leave my house with no prayers, uh, no pants, and no prayers for Christ's sake. Yeah. and I never brought made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I've understood God I have an understanding of God that you guys taught me about I'm going to turn my will and my life what is my will and my life my will is my thinking my life is my actions my will is my thinking my life is my actions everything I have done am doing and will do everything I wish I'd done would like to be doing and hope I'll do past, present and future so that I can live in the now everything I have done am doing and will do I'm going to put in his care for fixing and repair. Everything I wish I'd done would like to be doing and hope I'll do, which is totally different. See, everything I did and everything I wish I did was totally different, past, present and future. How can I live in the now, N-O-W, no other way, because I'm new, N-E-W, nothing else worked. How can I live in the now if I've got guilt, shame and remorse from yesterday? How can I live in the now if I've got fear, worry and anxiety about tomorrow? I can't live in the now if I've got guilt, shame and remorse from yesterday or fear, worry and anxiety about tomorrow. I learned that here, folks. I learned how to live in the now by putting my faith and trust. Trust in the third step, T-R-U-S-T. -S Try relying upon step three. 
I have faith and trust today. Trust. If you ask people, do they believe in God, they probably could say yes, a great many of us. Ask, ask those same people, do they have faith and trust in God, you'll get a different result. Try relying upon step three. Relying upon it. Trust. Takes on a totally different meaning. Made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. Care of God as opposed to what the book says. After the ABCs, you, you know that um, we read out chapter 5, it says, being convinced we were at step 3, which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understood him. It's not what the step says. Being at step 3, we were at step 3, which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understood him. It's not what the step says. The step says, turned our will and our life over to the care of God. A totally different thing. People who try to exaggerate say, oh, it's the same thing, it's just semantics, oh, you're just playing with... Yeah. <laughs> I got a white Jaguar sports car, 12-cylinder XJS. Love it. White Jaguar sports car. I live down there in Santa Monica. I'm a limey, for Christ's sake. I'm a limey, lush and loady. This is the way I speak. Alcohol didn't do this to me. You know? <laughs> I love my my 12-cylinder Jaguar. The license plate on it is AA12X12, AA12 and 12. 12 steps, 12 traditions, 12 cylinders. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Anonymity up the wazoo at this level. But it's a limey piece of shit is what it is, and it breaks down a lot. And when it breaks down, I'll take it back to the mechanic I got it from and put it in his care for fixing and repair. But I don't give the bastard my car. It's my car. I own it. I enjoy it. It's mine. DMV look for me for their dues and fees for it. But I put it in his care for fixing and repair. I made that mistake with my life, reading the book. I turned my life over to God. God seemed to say, what are you giving it to me for? I gave it to you. Well, I don't want it back. <laughs> I went, oh, I thought that's what you... No. Because the book and the step are different, you see. We've got to learn these things. We've got to be consciously aware of those things. Look, it's quarter past twelve, and we've got to pay respect to the old timers who are coming in here and following this this meeting. My telephone numbers, by the way, are eight one eight area code. Are you sober? Eight one eight. Are you like Toys R Us? S O B E R. Eight one eight. Not eight hundred, you cheap bastards. Eight one eight. Eight one eight. Or eight one eight. Are you clean? 818, are you clean? Are you, like Toys R Us, C-L-E-A-N, completely leaving every addiction now? You see, and you can reach me on both those numbers. I've had them for over 30 years, you know, and, and, and I love to hear from you. I love, I love being a small part of this great whole. I know some of you give me plenty of rah-rah. You, you, you pay me far more compliments than I deserve. I heard people here today say I saved their life. Well, it's all right for you to say it as long as I don't believe it. Yeah. I, I, I was at my old home group the other day and uh, a couple of well-known celebrities, celebrity actresses, Academy Award winning celebrity actresses that you'll know by name. You know, members of the group many years. Hadn't seen them in a long time. Came out of the meeting and said, Hi, Mick, I haven't seen you in a while. I said, Yeah, I don't live over here anymore. I just thought I'd give visit the old home group. One of them said, you know what, Mick? She said, I didn't realise what a celebrity you've become in Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, what? She said, I'm making a movie in New York, she said, and, 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 and I went to two meetings in New York, and in both the meetings, they quoted you and mentioned you by name. You're like this AA guru, like this AA celebrity. I said, yeah, bloody big deal, a celebrity in an anonymous program. <laughs> no. I said, you're a celebrity, I'm just a clean and sober, a small part of this great hole. And what steps one, two, and three really are saying is, I can't, he can, so let him. We have a power right here, right now. This power is of God and from God and provided by God. But it ain't God. This power that we have in Alcoholics Anonymous to not have to drink one day at a time. I liken it to the money in my pocket. The money in my pocket is of the bank and from the bank and provided by the bank. But it ain't the bank. There's a lot more to the bank than the money in my pocket. And there's a lot more to God than the power he provides alkies to not have to drink today. But don't let the disease tell you you're powerless like I hear walk, people walking around all day, every day, in Alcoholics Anonymous say, powerless, powerless, I'm so powerless, I'm powerless over everything, powerless over people, places and things, poor little powerless, 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 powerless. Why do we do that? 
that that is so alcoholic. In the beautiful book, Powell is mentioned 66 times. Powerless is mentioned once in the program of alcohol, in, in the first step of the program. Once powerless is mentioned, 66 times power is mentioned. New power has flowed in. We have recovered and been given the power to help the next guy. Praying only for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry out. Power, power, power. And yet we're going powerless. We're so powerless. If you work like I do with the troops and, and in, the, in the trenches, that is so alcoholic. You, you know, you get a guy, new guy, if 66 people told him, don't do that, but there's one guy over here who seems to be getting away with it, who does he take note of? No shit. <laughs> 66 times powerless mentioned, once powerless is mentioned, we'll go, powerless, powerless. In one of my houses down in San Fernando Valley, I've got two parrots, a blue one and a green one. Bill and Bob is their name. And I've trained them to speak. And you can, you can stand by the cage and they'll screech out at you. Powerless! Powerless! Alcoholic! Alcoholic! They're bloody parrots is what they are. But they could say they were alcoholic and powerless. I didn't want to be a parrot walking around here flapping my goddamn lips, talking jive out the side of my neck about stuff I didn't even know because I hadn't done the work to discover what the truth was. And I couldn't discover it from those folks out there. I had to come in here and discover it from the folks in here that were leaving footprints for me to follow. My own mum didn't understand me as much as you folks who'd never seen me before and might not see me again. You know me better than my own mum. Every year I go up to London, England to see me mum. It's twice a year sometimes. First thing I do, I go around my mum's house, I knock her up and I tell her, Mum, I'm 29 years sober. She says, so is the cat. <laughs> she doesn't give me no pat on the back when I'm doing something I shouldn't have done anyway. She says, I'm busy, I'm going to bingo. <laughs> but guess what, folks? She knows the benefit of me being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. My mum just passed this year. She passed with a smile on her face. She went to meet, meet her maker. I wasn't there, but my three sisters were. They told me. She had a big smile on her face. She came too. She came too. They said, What are you smiling at, mum? So what she said? She said, Mickey's doing good in America. How does that happen? How does a guy like me come out of a nutwood for the criminally insane? Get to put a smile on an old lady's face as she goes to meet and make it. Happens right here. Right here. You know, before she passed, she said, you'll have to send me some more CDs, Mick, she said. All the old girls down the club want to know how you're doing. She said, I brag about you all the time, she said. They all say to me, Mick, uh, Mary, tell us about Mickey in America. How's Mickey in America, Mary? And her chest would go out and she would tell them. Her friends and neighbours never used to say that. Her friends and neighbours used to say, are they going to let your Mickey out of the nut ward for Christmas this year, Mary? And she would hurt and she would cry because she loved me. Why do I keep coming back? Why am I not going nowhere? I wouldn't go nowhere without being in touch with Alcoholics Anonymous. I love being an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I love you. I love the laughter we share. They say, if you're laughing, you're relating. And if you're relating to a sick bastard like me, there ain't no doubt about you, pal. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I don't get through to no well, people. <laughs> I ain't going nowhere. I'm staying right here with you, and we have to leave. I could go on for hours. But namaste. Thank you for your attention.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.